Okay, so today we're going to um, be talking about the uh, space of holomorphic functions um, between complex manifolds and how it compares to spaces of continuous functions. And basically, we're going to compare holomorphic functions to um, the sum configuration space and um, uh, use ideas from scanning. Yeah, so we'll define some general configuration space of uh, particles with labels in a partial abelian monoid. Okay, so, and then um, at the end, we'll talk about the typo, um, the homotopy type of the twofold loop space of CP infinity wedge CP infinity. Okay. Oh yeah, just a comment on the overall plan of the course. Um, next, next week, um, uh, next week, uh, Zach and Nick are talking, and then uh, the week after we'll start opera ads. Uh, let me just double check my sound is on. Okay, my sound is on. Yeah, so what's what's a complex manifold? So uh, a complex structure on a manifold is, well, you know, well, what's a manifold? The manifold, you know, is a topological space such that there, there's this cover by um, uh, open sets homeomorphic to Rn and, uh, you know, some other points at topological conditions. So what's a complex structure on a manifold? Well, um, it's a uh, covering of M by open sets um, such that all the, these open sets are homeomorphic to C to the N. Well, right now that's not a condition because I mean, or all, all that is is a condition that M is even dimensional because you know, C to the N is um, homeomorphic to R to the 2N. Um, but then this condition about being a complex manifold is that um, you can pick these uh, on the overlaps uh, you can pick the functions to be holomorphic. Yeah, so you got your your manifold. You got like one ball. You have another ball. And, you know, you have a map C to the N in here. Map C to the N in there. And um, if you... Uh, you know, if these sets intersect, then there's some open subset in C to the N uh, such that, you know, the green C to the N maps the intersection, and then you can take the inverse of the blue embedding and get, and get a map from uh, C to the, from an open subset of C to the N to C to the N, and then we ask that that's holomorphic. So, you know, if the, the images of, you know, if the green ball and the blue ball don't intersect, then this condition is vacuous, but when they do intersect, it's a non-trivial condition. Um, yeah, and I guess implicitly, I mean, it's holomorphic when, uh, on the on its domain. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. So typical example would be maybe CP one, uh, which we're going to think of as C union um, infinity. And uh, you know, let um, the one of the we'll cover it with two copies of C to the n. So one we just embed C to the n via the identity map, and the other we embed via like z goes to one over z, so infinity goes to zero. And uh, they intersect on the units, so they intersect on the non-zero, non-infinity sub open subset of CP one. And um, this this red map here is just one over z, which is holomorphic. Okay. Um, and also, you know, if someone is not taking complex analysis and doesn't know what holomorphic means, um, but does know what like algebraic means, um, you know, all the manifolds I'll talk about today are going to be varieties. And so you can just think of think of it as algebraic maps. 
Um, yeah, I guess they'll all be uh, smooth projective, so there won't be any difference. Okay. So, you know, uh, what's a holomorphic map? Well, between two complex manifolds, it's a map such that um, when you use these charts to get maps from open subsets of C to the N to C to the N, that map needs to be holomorphic. Um, yeah, so that's what it means for a function to be holomorphic. You just translate it as a, to a condition about a function from C to the N to C to the N and ask that that function, those functions are holomorphic. Um, these phi alphas are called charts. Uh, and the space of holomorphic maps is just, you know, the subspace of all maps that are, um, happen to be holomorphic. Um, for today, we'll consider this with a subspace topology. Um, you might actually want to consider it with like a, a for shade, you know, C infinity topology or something. Um, but in, you know, in this case, it won't matter. Okay. So, um, let me just define the degree of a curve in CPM. Uh, oh yeah. So I guess I wrote curve because like the surface of genus G is a one dimensional complex manifold. Um, but you know, we can think of it as a surface, you know, it's a real surface or a complex curve. Uh, so, you know, if you have a, a, a map, even let's say just a continuous map from um, a Riemann surface into CPM, uh, an orientable closed Riemann surface, we define the degree to be, this is a, typo, um, the map on H2. So, you know, both of these groups are isomorphic to Z. And um, so we just define the degree to be the um, induced map on um, second homology. And we'll let Hall sub D and map sub D be the subspaces of degree D maps. And the, the theorem that I want to talk about today is this theorem of um, Graham Siegel from the uh, late 70s, which says that if you look at the inclusion of the space of holomorphic maps into the space of all continuous maps, that induces an isomorphism and homology in a range increasing with degree. So, you know, it'll depend on M and the genus, but um, if you fix the genus and you fix M, uh, this number tends to infinity with degree. So, you know, what it's saying is, like, maybe the um, space of degree three maps is a bad approximation. Degree three holomorphic maps is a bad approximation to the space of degree three continuous maps, but this, you know, space of degree a million holomorphic maps is a pretty good approximation to the space of degree a million continuous maps. Or, you know, maybe another way of saying it is if you have, if you have a family, if you have like a a family of continuous maps and you want to ask like can i deform that to a family of holomorphic maps well if you're in a the connected component or you know, if you um if your maps all have high degree then you know sufficiently high degree then you can okay any could you go back a second just to the previous slide just for me, read the definition one more time, real quick. Yes, and so there's this typo that this should be two. Yep. Um, UF is. F, F is just continuous. If it's if it's holomorphic, you you can define degree in terms of like you know. You can write f in terms of polynomials, and it's like the biggest, you know, exponent you see when you write f in terms of polynomials. But you can still, def you know, that will, will agree with this definition that makes sense for continuous maps. Okay. All right. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. So you know our proof. Um, Oh, let's see. We're 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 gonna 
I'm going to sketch a proof of a slightly, or, you know, uh, almost a subcase. So, you know, I'm going to assume the genus is zero, then this is CP1, and I'm going to assume M is one, so then this is also CP1. And then just for, for technical reasons, I'm going to assume that we're looking at base mapping spaces. It's pretty easy to go from the theorem for base mapping spaces to unbased mapping spaces. Um, so yeah, so this is the version I'm going to prove. The condition that they're based doesn't really add that much difficulty. The condition that we're mapping into CP1 doesn't add, or I mean, doesn't actually save that much. The fact that the domain is genus one uh, does help a lot and removes a lot of like algebraic geometry, and I don't need to say Jacobian and things like that. Um, so you know, if you like the Jacobian, um, I'm sorry. Or yeah, if you like the Jacobian, give it you know, volunteer to give a talk on how to prove this theorem in higher genus. Okay. Um, yeah. So in, in this case, we we're just saying that this map induces an isomorphism um, in homology up to degree d, and you know it'll be a surjection in degree d. And I guess this star means based. This star means homological degree. I should have written i here. That would have been better. Okay, so this is what we're going to sketch uh, a proof of today. Uh, oh, yeah, and so, oops, and this should be maps. Um, sorry for that typo. And then the observation is just that base maps from CP1 to CP1. Well, CP1... is... Um, is S2. So, you know, this is just loops to S2. And the, the idea is what we're going to do is we're going to uh, figure out how to think about this as a configuration space. Um, of like points in R2 with some cert certain kind of labels. And then um, we're going to build a scanning map from here to here, the dth component of the loop space. Sorry for all the typos. Um, and then, you know, I'll wave my hands and say the scanning map is homotopic to this, this natural inclusion map. And then, you know, the scanning map is a homology equivalence in the limit and you have homological stability. So then you, you get this theorem. So, you know, like, as stated, this doesn't exactly look at like the kinds of things we've been talking about, but um, it's not that hard to translate it into a statement about configuration spaces. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's just sort of get a better sense of what these uh, holomorphic maps look like. So the the most convenient base point condition is going to be that f of infinity is one. So here we're thinking of CP1. You know, CP1 is C union infinity is the coordinates we're using. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the this um, the topology of this mapping space won't depend on. Um, what um, what choice of base point you make because CP1 has a um, the group of like ho of um, holomorphic automorphisms of CP1 acts transitively on CP1. Um, yeah, so that's not um, like. It's, it's true that the group of homeomorphisms of a manifold always acts transitively on that manifold, but it's not true that the group of allomorphic automorphisms always acts transitively, but for, for CP1, it, it does. Um, yeah, so we're going to pick this base point, f of infinity is 1, and in those um, with that base point condition, then every holomorphic function is of the form f of z, is z minus r1, z minus r2, dot, dot, dot. Um, 
z minus p1, z minus p2, dot, 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 z minus pd. Yeah, so um, I guess a few comments. Yeah, so r1 through rd and p1 through pd, r and c. I've called them r and p because the r's are the roots of this function and the p's are the poles. Um, yeah, so, you know, like a, a holomorphic function from CP1 to CP1, um, you know, can come from, um, you know, I guess here I'm thinking of them as like meromorphic functions on C. But, you know, it, like if, um, and so, oh, was there a question? The D, it shouldn't be like the same number of poles zeros, right? Because you have D and it subscripts both. With this condition, right? So you plug in infinity. Oh. Okay. You plug in infinity, the top is going to be a degree D polynomial, the bottom is going to be a degree D, D polynomial. Um, and so, like, this will converge. You know, the fact that they're the same degree will mean that... Um, oh, yeah, no, I... See. Well, well, yeah, yeah. I mean that this is going to converge, and then the fact that the top and the bottom are both monic will mean that um, it'll converge to one, which is our, our base point condition. Uh, yeah, but if we had a different base point condition, there's no reason for them to be the same degree. Or if we just considered, you know, unbased maps. Um, and other comments. Yeah, so the... Um, in order for the limit as z goes to infinity to be one, the, the leading term, the coefficient of the leading term on the numerator and the denominator have to be the same. And it, you know, if I wrote like a seven here and a seven there, it wouldn't affect what the function is, right? So, um, you know, the data of the function doesn't depend on the the leading term, um, you know. Function depends on the ratio of the leading terms, but that's one. So we can assume that the top is monic and the bottom is monic. Um, yeah, so we can picture. Um, yeah, so if, if you want this to be degree D, then um, then you need that the uh, the roots and the poles uh, are different. Because if, um, you know, if uh, one of the Ri's equals one of the Pj's, you can just like cancel two of the terms and you have a degree D minus one um, polynomial. And we, we've topologized this space. I guess I should write a D here. We've topologized this space so that, um, you know, the, um, that, that uh, there's no pa path from a degree D to a degree D minus one. Um, yeah, from degree D holomorphic function to a degree D minus one holomorphic function, because there's no, you know, if there were, then there would be a path in the space of continuous functions, and we know that the connected components of the space of continuous functions from CP1 to CP1 are just given by degree. So in particular, from the configuration space side, this tells you that the roots and the poles can't collide with each other. So we have a configuration space of, like, you can think of as red points and blue points, and they're, they're labeled by numbers, and the sum of the labels of the red points adds up to D, and the sum of the labels of the blue points adds up to D. Um, so in this case, D is eight or something in this picture. Um, but roots and poles can't collide. Um, you know, so red points and blue points can't collide, because otherwise you'd have a, um, you know, because in the topology we're giving this a degree family of degree D functions can't converge to a degree D minus one function. Any, any questions? Yeah, so the upshot is that the space of holomorphic functions, um, yeah, so I mean, I guess, you know, like, probably this is, like an elementary complex analysis thing, um, where you know if you have a if you have a holomorphic function from CP1 to CP1, then it's a ratio of polynomials, and then the base point condition tells you uh, 
um, the extra conditions about the degree of polynomials. So the upshot is that you know this um, this holomorphic mapping space is um, can be thought of as a certain kind of configuration space. So now I'm going to tell you about some generalized configuration space. Um, so it's going to be configuration space as a points in a partial abelian monoid. So here, um, you know, there's some multiplication, like this, the red two and the other red two can collide, and then their labels would add to get six. But the one and the two can't collide because this one is, um, is red and this one is blue. Um, yeah. And um, okay, so so I need to tell you what. So this is sort of parameterized by the concept of a partial abelian monoid. So like some multiplications are allowed and some are not allowed. Okay, so what's a partial abelian monoid? Um, I guess in this case it'll be discrete, but um, you know you can make the de or the ones we're interested in, it'll be discrete, but it might as well. Make a definition for um, uh, well, allow things to be continuous. So it's a space, or if you want, it's a set. And then there's an element E, which is the unit. And um, you know the um, most important thing is the subspace comp. So these are the things inside P cross P that you know how to multiply. And then for the things you know how to multiply, there's a map from comp to p. Yeah, so the intuition is we don't know how to multiply everything. So if we knew how to multiply everything, there'd be a map from p cross p to p. We don't know how to multiply everything, but we know how to multiply some things. Um, and, um, you know, this m, tell, you know, this comp tells us what we know how to multiply, and the m tells us what we get when we multiply them. Okay. And so then there's some conditions. So I'm going to assume that if you know how to multiply P and Q, you know how to multiply Q and P. I wrote the same thing twice. And then the other order, uh, you always know how to multiply something by the uh, identity. Um, when you multiply them, it doesn't depend on the order. So that's this ab abelianness. Uh, you know, E is a unit, so you multiply P by E, you get P. And um, there, there's this condition. This condition basically says if you know how to multiply A and B, and then you know how to multiply it with C, then you know how to multiply B and C, and then multiply it with A. Um, and then, like, in, in that situation where you know to multiply everything, there's this associativity condition. Uh, any, any questions? So it, if comp were all of P cross P, it would, um, this would just be the definition of a monoid, an abelian monoid. Okay, so here are some sort of trivial examples. So, um, yeah, so if you have a space then and a, a point, then you can just sort of declare, or you know, this is sort of the minimal partial abelian monoid. You know, so you can pick a point, call it E, then you can let comp be P wedge P. So this wedge depends on a base point, and the base point is E. Um, yeah, so what is it saying? It's saying, hey, I know I'm multiply P and E, and I know I'm multiply P and E the other way, and that's just P, and I don't want to multiply anything else. So just, you know, the set with the base point, you can view it as a partial monoid, the base point is the unit, you don't know how to add any two things together unless one of them is the unit, and then you're, you're forced. So that's one sort of trivial example. Other example, just P is a monoid, E is the unit, and comp is all of P cross P, and M is the multiplication map. So this is sort of the 
maximal example, and this is sort of the, the minimal example of a partial abelian monoid. So on one hand, we just have base spaces, and the other hand, we have monoids. I guess I should write abelian. Any questions? Okay. So here are some other examples that I like. Uh, so this one won't be relevant to, the, to holomorphic maps, but it's um, my, yeah. My thesis was about this partial abelian monoid. Um, okay. So yeah, so it, you, P is just gonna be number zero through D and what numbers do we know how to add? Well, we want to add, you know, m of a plus or m of a and b is just going to be a plus b. Um, and so, what does comp have to be? Well, this needs to be a map whose codomain is p. So, we know how to add numbers whose sum is less than d because you know otherwise it would exit d. So, comp is going to be the set of num of pairs a b with a plus b less than or equal to d, and then for those numbers, you know how to add them. So, like if D is five, we know how to add three and we know how to add three and two, but we don't know how to add three and three. Um, you know, the example that's going to be relevant to the um, space of, of holomorphic maps is going to be this um, partial abelian monoid I'm called N wedge N. So remember N, N contains zero in my notation. Um, yeah, so what is this? It's um, you know, a set of A and B such that one of them is zero. How I'm going to think of it. Um, you know, so viewing the wedge as a subspace of the product, E is going to be zero, zero. And um, like um, A zero plus B zero is A plus B zero. 0a plus 0b is 0a plus b, and no other multiplications are defined. So, you know, you take a monoid and you take another monoid, you wedge them together along the unit, and then you own the only non-unit um, additions, multiplications, whatever you, you want to call it, that are defined are going to be if both elements are are on the left or both elements on the right, then you add them in the usual way. Yeah. So. This this example is what parameter you know parameterizes what's happening with the roots and poles because you know you have the red things and the blue things and the uh, red um, okay so oh yeah any any questions about partial abelian monoids before I talk about configuration spaces of um, partial abelian monoids. Or with labels and partial abelian monoids. Yeah, so the, the idea is we want some configuration space, and the labels are in this partial abelian monoid, and two points can collide if and only if um, they're, um, you know, their labels form an element of comp. So comp stands for composable. Um, and then in, in which case, um, the way you add them is you um, use the multiplication map. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so we'll let P be a partial abelian monoid. And, oh yeah, so we'll need this comp J. What is comp J? Comp J is going to be um, the subspace of P to the J of things that you know how to multiply together. So when J is one, um, oh wait, sorry, zero is. I think this should be a plus one. Yeah, so the idea is that comp zero is P, comp one is comp, comp two is all the things 
in p cubed that you know how to multiply, etc. Um, and so we're going to define the uh, the configuration space with labels in p, basically to be. Um, so you're going to take points in x. So we have like the space x, and we have a partial abelian monoid p, and we're going to take um, points in x with labels in p. And we're going to, um, if um, if two points in x, you know, if x1 equals x2, say, then we're going to require that the labels p1 and p2 be in comp. If we have three points at the same spot, um, maybe this is the minus one, I don't know, my indexing. Oh, yeah, better way to fix it. Yeah, so um, let's just start with one. Um, yeah, so so this comp or this conf hat is the conf, um, is uh, this configuration space of points in X with labels in P, and um, if a bunch of points coincide, then their labels have to be composable, and then the configuration space we're actually interested in. Is the quotient where we say that if a bunch of points coincide, then you multiply their labels. Yeah. Okay, so if P is an abelian monoid, then the configuration space um, of points in X with labels in P is just what we were calling P of X before. Um, so what, what, what can you plug in for P to get the usual configuration space of unordered points in X? So yeah, so I, the first example says that this is a generalization. You know, so if you plug, you know, this is a generalization, like if you plug in Z, this is a generalization of the free abelian group on a space. Um, how is this construction also a generalization of the configuration space of distinct unordered points? Any guesses of what we should pick for P? Here there is like an obvious guess that's wrong, but someone should say it. And then it's like, or there may be two obvious guesses and one of them is wrong and one of them is right. It's worth, you know, it's worth someone saying the wrong one just so we can make progress and it'll help us find the correct one. Well, I don't see why it's not Z. Oh, so well, if you plug in Z, then the points are labeled by integers. So you right. plug in Z, you know, you would get like point labeled by like one, point labeled by seven, you know, point labeled by three, and then they can collide. Um, but we want like we want points that are um, that don't have labels and that they can't collide. Mm, okay, okay. Um, oh yeah, one thing I guess maybe I glossed. It was written on the last slide, but we have this condition that uh, points labeled by the unit vanish. Yeah, so if you have if one of the points is labeled by E, then it vanishes. Hopefully my E is different enough from my P. Yeah, so my question is like what, what should we take P to be to get the just the configuration space of unordered points in X? Uh, Michael wrote something in chat. How do I get chat? Um, yeah, so Michael suggested let's just take zero and one. Yeah, so the idea is that, well, you know, zero will be the unit. So, um, yeah, this is, I just, I called it S zero, but yeah, 
it's equivalent to saying zero and one. So what Michael was saying is like, okay, we're gonna have points labeled by zero. We're gonna have points labeled by one, but all the points labeled by zero vanish. So we don't really need to think about them. So then we just get points labeled by one. And the points labeled by one can't collide with each other. Uh, because, you know, the only additions that are defined, there, there are no additions defined here other than with the unit, and the unit is sort of invisible. This, that makes sense. This is what you're going for, right? Okay. Let me move this point over here. Um, yeah. And, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, so this, this construction is, is fairly general. You know, it generalizes the thing we talked about for the first, I don't know, quarter of class and it general, or first quarter of the semester, and it generalizes what we talked about for the last quarter of the semester. Um, and then, you know, it also, um, is going to generalize holomorphic functions. So it's not exactly equal to this, to this space of holomorphic functions. So, oh yeah, I guess we need this definition. So let conf AB be the subspace where the sum of the, uh, it, you know, with labels in N wedge N, subspace where the sum of the labels, uh, you know, the sum of the um, blue points is going to be A, and the sum of the red points is going to be P. E. So here, I guess, you know, this N is blue and this N is red or something. So, uh, and if X is connected, let's say, you know, if X is like a connected manifold of dimension at least two, then this is A and B are going to give the, um, give the connected components of this configuration space. Just like, what's the sum of the red points? What's the sum of the blue points? Um, yeah, because you know, if you're connected um, and like dimension at least two, you can bring all the blue points together and you can bring all the red points together and the dimension at least two means they can move past each other. Okay, so you know, then the observation is that the space of degree D holomorphic maps with this preferred choice of base point is just the DD component of the configuration space of points in C with labels in N wedge N. Okay. So, yeah, so what we want to do is we want to study this configuration space. Um, and, you know, uh, as usual, like relative configuration spaces are going to be useful. They're defined in the same way they're always defined. You just um, you know, if you have the subset, subset y, you um, basically you throw out points in y. Um, there's like an extra parenthesis here. That, that parenthesis is just a typo. Yeah, so just configurations of points, and then um, you can think of them as it converges to zero if the point enters um, enters y. Okay, um, I guess before, so this relative configuration space will be needed for stating the, the scanning theorem. And then um, before I do that, uh, I'm gonna talk about the um, completion of um, partial abelian monoids. Um, I guess I forgot the word abelian, but today all, all the monoids I'm interested in are gonna be abelian. Uh, yeah, so, you know, you should think of it, you know, like this is probably some left adjoint. You should think of it like sheafification or the growth and deep group or, you know, if anyone has other left adjoints that they, they like. Yeah, so what you, basically what you're, you're doing is you're going to say I'm going to add... Um, Um, 
uh, yeah, so what have we done? So uh, the completion is going to be z of p mod z of the unit modulo another relation that says that um, p plus q is equivalent to um, m of pq if pq is in comp. Yeah, so what's what's the idea? So it's it's like what is this? This is formal sum, so this might be like you know, p1 plus p2 plus p3, and then I'm saying, hey, this is equal to p1 plus p2 if p3 is e. And then I'm also saying that like p1 plus p2 plus p3, you know, is, let's say, p4 plus p3 if, um, you know, if p1 and p2 are composable and m of p1, p2 is um, p4. And again, this is, you know, whenever I write an equivalence relation, but then the thing I write down is not an equivalence relation, I mean the equivalence relation generated by what I write down. So I'm pretty sure this is not, I'm pretty sure this is not an, an equivalence relation, but I just mean the equivalence relation generated by that. Yeah, so, you know, so basically what, what it's saying is if you don't, you know, if you don't know how to add P1 and P2, like they're not in comp, their sum is just the formal sum P1 plus P2. But if you did know how to add them, then, you know, add them that way. Um, yeah, so what happens if you take, let's say D is not zero, you take um, this partial abelian monoid numbers zero through D, and then you complete it. Yeah, so the claim is that this, this P bar is going to be a partial abelian monoid. And, you know, you could probably write some universal mapping property, like if you have a map out of P into, a mono, into an abelian monoid, you know, something or other, then you get a unique monoid map out of P bar. So any guesses for what, what I claim this is some familiar monoid. Any, any guesses? Yeah, Zach guesses n. Yeah, so this is just the natural numbers. So, you know, let's just for concreteness say that d is 2. So what's an element here? You know, an element here might be like, well, 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1. Um, and, you know, so we're going to send that to six and that's not the only thing that would go to six, you know, you might be like, well, two plus two plus two also goes to six, but, um, you know, one plus one is two. So, you know, these two things are equal. I don't know if that helps. I don't know why there's a minus sign. Oh no, that's an arrow. Not minus two, it's an arrow. Any, any questions or, I guess like people, you know, usually don't think about partial algebraic structures. Yeah. Um, okay, what if, uh, oh yeah, so it's n if d is greater than zero. If d is zero, then this thing is just, you know, the group zero. Um, so what is the completion of n wedge n? Any guesses? Uh, 
Is it n cross n maybe? Yeah, yeah, it's just n cross n. Um, yeah, because every every element in n cross n can be written as a sum of an a, you know an element of the form like something zero plus zero something. So you know there's a map and it's surjective, and then you know all the relations. Yeah, so I mean, if you looked at, I don't know, if you looked at the map from like n of n wedge n and cross n, you know, the map's going to be surjective. And then you can look at like, what's the kernel of this map? And it's exactly the things that we're modding out by to get the completion of n wedge n. Okay. Um, Um, other things, oh yeah, if you took like, the, uh, the completion of like negative one, zero, one with the obvious partial monoid structure, you'd get Z, pretty sure, you know, where minus one plus one is zero, and zero plus anything is zero and nothing else is defined. If you completed that, you'd get Z. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so um, what's the point of the completion? Uh, oh, there's a question. Oh, Michael's pointing out that my like entire definition is wrong. Was that your comment? That this should be the definition? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, that's a typo. Um, yeah, we don't we we don't want to just add add inverses in. Sorry. Yeah. Otherwise, what you'd be doing is you'd be completing it, getting a monoid, and then group and degrouping, group group completing. Yeah. Sorry. So we want p bar to be basically the smallest monoid containing p. Sorry if this caused confusion. Um, we want p bar to be the smallest monoid containing p. Um, not the um, yeah. Uh, as written, it would be the smallest abelian group containing P, and that's definitely not what we want. Yeah, so we want this thing to always be a monoid, but we don't want it necessarily to always be a group. Okay. Yeah, so um, there's a theorem that says that there's a, there's a scanning map from configurations of points in R with labels in P to the loop space of the relative configuration space. So uh, like points in a disk, rel sphere with labels in P. Um, such that, well, there's sort of two conditions. So um, if pi zero of the monoid completion is a group, then S is a homotopy equivalence. And um, the second condition is that S is a homology equivalence after you take homotopy co-limits by stabilization maps. Uh, examples now. Yeah, so... Um, um, oh yeah, and there's there's a manifold version involving sections of a bundle, but we're not going to need that today. So I just stated the Rn version, but you can you know you can replace Rn with a manifold and replace this loop space with um, yeah space of sections of some bundle. Um, so the comment is that you know when p is you know if p is s zero, then this is just going to say that usual conf rn has a has a scanning map to loops loops and um, then this relative configuration space will be equivalent to sn um, yeah like on the other hand let's say p is z if, um, if p is z then um, Then we get Z of Rn, um, which is just equivalent to Z on the left. And then on the right side, we get um, 
loops n, and then this thing is our model for an Eilenberg McLean space. So k z n, um, you know, k z n ha has um, the only homotopy group is z in degree n, um, and then you you know you loop it and you're going to get um, or sorry you, you loop it and then you move it to degree zero. So then this whole thing would be a kz zero, but you know z is a model of a kz zero. Uh, yeah, so in the case of Z, the map is a, is a homotopy equivalence. In the case of S0, the map is um, uh, not a homotopy equivalence. So here, P bar is N, which is a, a monoid but not a, a group. So, you know, the, the idea is, hey, well, this loop space, loop spaces sort of have have inverses. Um, so the, the if this maps a homotopy equivalence, you know, then on pi zero, this thing needs to have inverses too. Um, which corresponds to the um, completion of the monoid having inverses. Any questions? So, um, part, part of my thesis was proving this for the, the manifold version of uh, this statement uh, in the, or the second part of the statement for general manifolds. Okay, so, um, you know, a corollary of Salvatore's theorem, so Salvatore's theorem. Wait, wait, I did have a question. I just thought that you were going to say something about the second part of the statement because, uh, to be honest, I don't I don't understand what it means. Oh, yeah. Well, so the, the second part, you know, just like, uh, oh, yeah. So the se second part, so if you take P to be S0, then the second part Um, specializes to like configurations of points in Rn, the classical configuration space, you know, distinct points, and the um, n-fold loop space of Sn. And we, this map isn't an equivalence, but if you, uh, it is an equivalence if you take like the homotopy co-limit under stabilization maps. Sorry, it's a homology equivalence. You know where the, the stabilization maps are these unconnected components are the maps like this so you maybe first i'll say like do you have any questions in the s0 case what i mean and then i'll talk about the more general case Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, kind of um, understand what it means to take the homotopical limits by the stabilization map. Like, what is the... Oh, yeah, so I mean, the stabilization maps do a self map of the configuration space. You know, so the... Uh, like... I'm just saying, like, you know, so we, um, the, the connected components, you know, in this S0 case of this configuration space are just the configuration space of K points. And the stabilization map gives you a map from K points to K plus one points. And I'm saying you can view that as just a map on the entire configuration space. Mm, okay. Just like a sequence of... Um, 
Yeah. Maps. You know, this this T map is the. You, know, you you got a bunch of points, and then, you, oops. I don't know why that happens. You know, the the T map is just you got a bunch of points. Why does it vanish? I don't, I don't know. I guess our manifold is Rn, so I'll just draw it as a square. And the map. Let's say it brings one point in from the right. So that gives you a, a self map of this space. So, you know, if you have a, a sequence of spaces, I don't know. Why? Does anyone have any idea what I'm clicking that would make it kill everything? You know, if you have a sequence of spaces and maps, you can, um, you can form a, the homotopy co-element. You know, it's this. Um, do you first take um, homotopy and then, I mean, homology and then. So I was saying you, do space, you, do, you build the space level thing, right? If you have. You know, if you have spaces and maps between them, you, you mm -hmm. take your space, cross it with an interval, glue it into the next space along your map. So, the, the, you know, X1 is like the circle. You take X1, cross an interval, glue it to X2, cross an interval, glue it to X3, cross an interval, and you glue them along the maps. So it's kind of like, you know, if you if you didn't cross with an interval, it would basically just be like you're taking the union of all of these x's along the, the maps. But here we're sort of crossing with an interval um before we glue them just to make sure that um you know, the the um maps are slightly better behaved homotopically. Um, yeah, so I'm saying like, but so, but you, but this makes sense. If you have one space and a self map, you can just let all the X's be the same and let all the F's be that one self map. So I'm saying you can build this space like Hoko Lem along the stabilization map of Kant. Yeah. And then I'm saying the loop space also has um, has stabilization maps that are compatible. So you can compare this space and that space. Or so the scanning map is going to give you a map from this upper space to this lower space. And then we say like that induces an isomorphism on homology. Um, and, you know, it, 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 the stabilization maps, you, you get sort of different stabilization maps for each sort of element in I0 of P, but just take them all uh, in the case that P is not just like S0. So, you know, you, you'll need sort of, because you're bringing a point in from infinity, you want to bring points in from infinity with like all different sort of possible labels in P when you're forming this homotopy co-limit. So the spaces will always be the same, but if, um, you know, P has lots of different connected components, you're going to want lots of different stabilization maps here. Um, 
Yeah. So what? What? Um, yeah. So the um, so, so Siegel did sort of the same thing um, that we were talking about in the classical configuration space case. So he, you know, he proved a scanning theorem in the limit, and then also proved homological stability, which will give you this concrete statement that um, the scanning map induces an isomorphism from the homology of all right oh no sorry this is just homological stability so this slide doesn't have a typo yeah so he proved homological stability so the homology of configurations of points in um, with labels in this partial abelian monoid um, when you increase um, let's say you increase the number of roots, that's an isomorphism in a range given by the min of the number of poles and roots, and similarly when you increase the number of poles. So, you know, this what is this map? This map just adds an extra root to the right. You know, it shoves everything over a little bit to the left and it adds a root to the right. Um, yeah, and then if you combine this with the, the, the scanning theorem, you get that the uh, homology of configurations of points in R2 with labels in N wedge N, so this is like the space of roots and poles, is equivalent to this loop space uh, in a range. Yeah, so the, the stabilization maps on the loop space side are all homotopy equivalences, and then using homological stability, we can sort of get rid of this homotopy co-limit in a range, and so we get that the homology of the, this configuration space and the homology of this loop space agree in a range. Um, any questions? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so the corollary, if you plug in A equals B equals D, says that, um, uh, that this space of holomorphic maps of degree D is isomorphic to the, um, oh yeah, so one thing like high zero, high zero of this loop space is N cross N, so I'm letting A, B be the A, B component of that. So this says that, um, you know, this space of holomorphic maps in a range, you know, in a, has the same homology in a range with this, Two-fold loop space of this weird relative configuration space. Yeah, so um, we're we're not we're not done. So what we know is that the homology of the space of holomorphic maps agrees with this um, two-fold loop space of um, uh, whatever this weird space is, and what we want. You know, we um, we wish this blue thing were just S2, because we want to compare it to continuous maps to CP1, CP1 is S2. So, like, we want to know, how does this blue thing compare to S2? Uh, yeah, so that's what we need to do. Oh, yeah. Any questions on the overall like, state of what I've sketched a proof of and what I'm going to talk about next? Okay, so the um, we know that um, I guess we talked about a, a while ago that um, the free monoid on a disk rel its boundary is CP infinity. So this was some like you think of CP infinity as polynomials given by their um, you think of this as like the projective space of the space of all polynomials. And then you think of this as like the spa space of roots of polynomials or something. But I don't know, a while ago we proved that this space is homeomorphic to that space, you know, which, which you know, CP infinity is a KZ2. I think this actually won't be relevant, but you know, it's good to know. Um, so, um, there's a map 
from um yeah so you can think of the blue so this this is you know n of a disk this is like the space of roots of a polynomial and this is the space of poles of a polynomial i mean you know they're the same there's no difference between roots and poles but um so what you can do is you can you can map you can map um like this is you can map configurations of points in a disk with labels in n into this configuration space in two different ways you can map it in as the roots or you can map it in as the poles and um and you you know if you have roots and you have poles you can't map them in together unless you have no roots or poles so what oh sorry you know so um that's sort of the wedge um yeah so i guess what i'm saying is this um space on the left you should think of as the subspace of the space on the right where you either have roots or you have poles and this wedge point is when you have neither um and then the claim is that this is a homotopy equivalence and this is one of those zoom in arguments yeah so the thing the space on the left is going to be the space of of like roots or poles and the space on the right is roots and poles and note in both cases we're working rel the boundary of the sphere so rel s1 and what's the idea well you know let's say this is the origin you look at the distance from you look at the distance to the nearest root you look at the distance to the nearest pole you take the max of that uh, that number is going to be strictly positive because they're either, you know, there might be no roots at, at the origin, there might be no poles at the origin, but there can't be both. So if you take the max of the distance to the nearest root and the distance to the nearest pole, that'll be positive. And then what you do is you sort of, you know, take half that distance. So that's some ball. In that ball, you're either going to see roots or poles or neither. And then you just expand outward. And, you know, points vanish when they hit the boundary of the disk. Um, so this gives a homotopy equivalence from this relative configuration space to this thing on the left, but the thing on the left is CP infinity wedge CP infinity. Any questions? Okay, so yeah, so what we did was, so we uh, we have loops to of this space, which seems scary, and we've said up to homotopy, that's CP infinity wedge CP infinity. And now what do we need to do? Well, we need to compare CP infinity wedge, you know, loops two of CP infinity wedge CP infinity with S2. So, um, So um, there's a theorem that says that uh, there's a you know there's a vibration with total space homotopy equivalent S two and base space homotopy equivalent to CP infinity wedge CP infinity and the fibers are S one and then this is maybe this will even be a fiber bundle and then this this is going to imply that the um, connected components of loops two CP infinity and loops two S two are the same because if you you know look at the long exact sequence in homotopy groups um you know you're gonna have loops of the total space loops of the base and loops of the fiber and um you know loops shifts homotopy groups down and s1 only has homotopy groups in degree zero and one so when you take the two-fold loop space of s1 you're going to get something contractible so it's going to say that the components of the um Two-fold loop space of CP infinity wedge CP infinity and loops two S2 agree. So even though CP infinity and S2 or CP infinity wedge CP infinity, you know, is some weird infinite dimensional space, and S2 is maybe a less scary space, when you take two-fold loop spaces up to connected components, the, the spaces agree. Um, which is you know what we want. So that'll prove 
if we can show that, that'll prove Siegel's theorem up to, you know, you still need to say the scanning map and the inclusion map are um, homotopic, but one can check that. Um, any questions? Yeah, so this is sort of just like a homotopy theory thing, and it has nothing really to do with directly to do with configuration spaces, or at least the techniques we're going to use won't involve configuration spaces. Here's like a there's a definition. So if you have a if you have a group and you have a space with the right G action and a space with the left G action, uh, you can take the product over G. So X cross over G with Y um, is just X cross Y modulo the relation that G acting on the right is the same as G acting on the left. I probably want to write G here, maybe. G should probably be on that side of the X. Oh, and maybe if someone wants to tell me, hey, actually X has a left G action or something, great. Um, yeah, so if you take X cross G with a point, so here like G acts on X in some way, and G acts on the point trivially because that's the only way G can act, you just get the quotient. And if you take X cross over G with G, you just get X because, you know, no matter how G acts on X, um, like G is going to sort of act. You know, you should think of this as like if you have a module tensor over a ring with the ring, you're going to get back out the module. Um, yeah. Um, or you can just write it down. Okay, so we want to prove that there's this vibration. So we're going to let E be S infinity cross S2. So S infinity is contractible. So E is homotopy equivalent to S2. And then now we're going to let B be um, S infinity cross over S1 with S2. So there's a map from um, E to B because B, you know, this crossing over a group um construction is um call it you know it's defined to just be a quotient of the usual product and i think because s you know so s1 is going to act on s infinity in the usual way like you could think of s infinity as the non-zero vectors in c infinity and s1 will be you know a subgroup of um um, non-zero complex numbers acting by a multiplication. So since S1 acts freely on S infinity, um, that's going to tell you that the fibers are all S1. Um, yeah, so what's left is to identify B. So we need to identify B with CP infinity wedge CP infinity. So yeah, so our, all that remains is we need to show S infinity cross over S1 with S2 with CP infinity wedge CP infinity. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about, um, you know, so here's a picture. I'm not drawing S infinity. I'm just drawing the S2. So how does S1 act on S2? So here I'm going to let S1 um, act on S2 via rotation. So, you know, if you have like a ball, I no longer have a ball in my room, um, you know, and you, you spin the ball, there's going to be uh, two fixed points. Um, yeah, so if you look at, um, if you look at like one of, right in red, if you look at one of these red circles in the ball, you know, it looks like an S1 acting on itself, um, you know, just the usual way a group acts on itself via multiplication. So if you look at the red part, you're going to get S infinity cross S cross over S1 with S1. The S1s will cancel and you'll get S infinity, which is basically equivalent to a point. So this, all of these red things look like a point. What happens when you up to homotopy? What happens when you have, um, you look at the green points, so these are the fixed points. So you get a, a point 
cross over S infinity with S1. So that's S infinity cross S1. And that's just CP infinity. So what, what is this construction? Well, you, you know, if you look at it, you're going to get like a CP infinity on the left, a CP infinity on the right. And then in the middle, you're going to get a bunch of S, you know, S infinities, but S infinities are contractible. So it's basically CP infinity connected along an interval to another CP infinity. You can contract down that interval and you just get CP infinity wedge CP infinity. Sorry for going over. Um, but yeah, so this is a sketch of Siegel's theorem. I'm going to stop the recording.